Hello everyone. Today we talk about Tonian knighthood, and we will concentrate in this phase of post-Carolingian Germany to see the development of the knightly class in the uh, Eastern Frankish Kingdom. And this is just the first of some videos I would like to make, even on the other post-Carolingian kingdoms. Um, also, this will include part of Carolingian history necessarily, but it, it's mostly of about the 10th century, so the moment in which objectively the, the European knightly class was was formed as a military as a military class, as a matter of fact, that was also capable of conceiving itself as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the uh, miles in the um, the high medieval sense of of the word that is not just the fighter, the soldier. Uh, proper, the, the one who received the, the pay, like it had been in the ancient world, but something more that is obviously loaded with many further meanings, bo deriving both from actually the same Roman tradition, but also and especially from the Christian one and the pagan one. Um, <coughs> that, especially in, in, in countries like, you know, it, it's particularly interesting to make a comparison between the various post Carolingian kingdoms because naturally they had different traditions. And therefore, the knightly class that was born in there was differentiated on, on some basis. To, today, we look at Germany. That um, at this point is an uh, uh, is very fascinating in itself because it's it's still a crossroad of many. Um, I would say not just pol well say political and military cultures as well because you know that at this point Germany is the Basically, it's the last conquest, if you want, of, of of the Carolingian world, or at least the one that was um, significantly more um, <coughs> difficult to get started with the um, you know the, the system that the Carolingians had uh, began to, to develop. There, there isn't actually a very strong uh, distance between the Franks specifically and and the Germans, this set of, of, of peoples, the different ethnicities actually as they conceived themselves as that populated the, the area roughly comprehended by today's Germany and not only actually. Um, so a world that in great part was still under the, uh, the first of all had been outside, at least in larger part, from the Roman world proper, right? The, the Carolingians um, actually accomplished more than w the Romans in Germany to Germany because they managed basically to assimilate Germany into um, in, in an incredibly quick way. Naturally, the the situation was a bit different because during the migration era, even Germany had changed consistently, um, also a lot in terms of society, even on land exploitation. It was definitely not such um, <clears throat> a tough ground, like it had been, uh, as a different potential for for the Romans back in the day when they they invaded Germany. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's something that took really a great amount of sources, uh, of resources. Sorry, I, I mean the Carolingian conquest came at a very disadvantageous cost-benefits ratio. You know, in the first campaigns, the Carolingians objectively. Um, <coughs> lost more than they gained, but if you look at on the longer period, which is actually not even so long, well, with the conquest of Saxony, basically the Carolingians integrated this. That, that first of all, they accomplished the the conquest of all Germany at that point, um, as actually since Merovingian times, certain area of of the, especially of, of central Germany proper and southern Germany had been colonized by the Franks, had been progressively um, <coughs> kind of transformed, but the, first of all, they 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 get this all together. They manage to shift their their boundaries up to the Elbe River, the, beyond which that there are actually the Slavs. Um, the the ethnical geography is very different from today's ones, as we know. And it passed, in fact, even through <coughs> this uh, not just the Carolingian conquest, but that actually stopped to those limits. But from exactly from Ottonian times was expanded to towards the east, we'll see now, even with military expeditions against the, the, the Polabians, the Poles, the, the, the Bohemians, etc. But uh, the, um, the idea here is that Germany is, um, is somewhat integrated in the Vassalatic um, beneficiary system. 
um, it, it that culture gets started, but it gets started with a very different degree um, from from France uh, proper <coughs> or the Western Frankish Kingdom, say better. Um, also from other post Carolingian uh, regions, because in fact everyone had a, a different story. But um, there is a component of of the Eastern Germanic uh, society during the 10th century, Etonian times, that is still um, really about that previous, um, if you want, tribal system that um, <coughs> had existed up to you know, the, the Carolingian conquest. And when I say tribal system, it doesn't absolutely mean that um, even the, uh, I mean, Germany in the, uh, at the eve of the Carolingian um, conquest was somewhat the same that it had always been. Actually, it was very different. Um, the same contact with, uh, with Rome in the previous centuries, but also with, with the Merovingian Franks and the Carolingian Franks had had been consistent, had been some sort, think about the Saxons actually interacted with the same Franks, they cooperated to, to wipe out the, the Thuringians back in the day, there were contacts, actually, as we were saying before, actually Frankish and Saxon, uh, if, you, you know, if you look at the law, um, the Lex Salica, it's not very different from, from the Saxon one, Even if it was if effectively the Franks imposed their own laws and administration into Saxon eventually, but Let's say that there was this um, element of, um, let's say, first of all, Germany was poorer on average. Like, the, the Western Frankish Kingdom was way more florid. I mean, the, the, the great Atlantic plains that stretch, in fact, from, from the Pyrenees to, to, to Germany, proper to the Jutland, are uh, extremely fertile. Germany, in, in its interland, is, is very different. It's cold, it's still covered largely in forests, huge forests, thick forests that separate effectively those ethnic groups as they thought them themselves like that, that were shaped, in fact, because of these natural boundaries, um, and in swamps as well. So naturally, this proto-feudalism that is uh, st getting started at this point is, is able to change. We've said it many times. The even the, the same landscape of this land, but actually it, it takes really a lot. I mean, it's a pluricircular process, the one that brought Germany to, to become basically a, fu a fully feudalized country like, like France. Mm -hmm. just, just bear in mind that the actual French model feudalism is r basically imported once, uh, once again in the... <coughs> Uh, in, in the mid-12th century by Frederick I of Oenstauf. And up to that point, Germany was very uh, wild, we can't say, without many uh, different... You just look at the commercial penetration, look at the, the degree of urbanization, look at even at art. Um, uh, Germany had been very conservative because they hadn't had the, the means to develop and, and therefore the needs actually to develop in that Frankish form. And in this sense, I don't want to present the thing as if it was the, the failure of a sort of progressivist um, idea. Um, feudalism, as we've said many times on, on Schmerpunkt, we, we, we observed how really um, uh, imposing it was in terms of, of, of social differences, of social certification, of hierarchization of society, and, and naturally this had also played a great part into the resistance that, for example, the Saxons had opposed to the Carolingians, etc., because they realized that not only those were foreigners uh, or that were coming to, to rule on their own land, they were bringing another view of the world, they were bringing a view of the world that was really attacking the very base of their society, it was this kind of relatively egalitarian or kind of democratic um, way of government, of social organization that, you know, when I say uh, democratic or egalitarian, obviously you have to take it in the most neutral um, sense of the word, it was nothing as we mean as egalitarian or democratic. Germany had always had, since the, the, the beginnings, uh, an aristocratic society. That is to say that the guys that had more power were in charge, they were uh, there was a hierarchy, of course, but still the idea was that basically every freeman had the right not to, to be um, to become a serf, to become a, a someone that was under someone else, and and 
we haven't really been talking a lot about this. Maybe um, on that video on the syncretism of the North, I've, I've, I've hinted at a little bit. But this was a big question in in the development. There were many regions of Europe that, um, if you see in this, uh, it's paradoxical because it's as if modernization actually brought an actual progress because the it's mm, it's undeniable that feudalism contributed greatly to the expansion of European economy. The myth of courtly economy uh, based on barter, a closed economy, is just a fairy tale. Maybe you can read it in some comic, not in history books anymore. Um, but this came at a cost, at a political cost, loss of freedom. That passed even through these events. And Germany is a great example in here because uh, not just because of the Saxon resistance, but because of many other um, aspects. In fact, you can draw from its society at this time. Think about even the, the Stendinger uh, revolt that had taken place um, in the 40s of the 9th century during the civil wars of the Carolingians that took advantage of this for the freemen and the uh, freedmen, um, to, so the former slaves, um, to actually take arms against the aristocracy that at that point was, you know, a Carolingian emanation, or at least was cooperating with it, or in this uh, in this way for, for strengthening its power and in this grip on, on society, right? Because, as we were saying before, there were aristocrats in there, who were quite powerful, that always tried to impose their monarchy in some ways. The history of the migration era is, is a great history even of the relation between the the monarchy and the people. We were talking about it uh, a couple of days ago when discussing, for instance, the history of the Longobards. There were times in which these aristocracies mani managed um, or tried at least to impose their, their kingship for the sake of uh, military command as it was used among the Germans to appoint a, a leader, a, a military leader to when, when in times of, of, of trouble, times of war, or even just a migration definitely entailed to clash with someone along the way, but then they were deposed and who tried at that point to to say strengthen themselves on the base that on a base that actually didn't exist because Germanic society was so, you know, flat in 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 relative terms that there was no base on which to to oppose the the large majority of the freemen, right? And this came uh, along with many other um, important and even Ottonian Germany in itself. It, it's it's really fascinating because it shows you how a land that up to that point had not had any kind of cohesion. Uh, from from a political point of view, was with great difficulty kind of tried to be brought together by means that were sometimes not necessarily physical, because naturally policy and war is, is particularly important into this, but that had to stem from, from something else. Even the Renovatio Imperi starts actually from these bases. That is to say, we don't have any true sort of legitimization. Take the Ottonian dynasty in itself. The Ottonian dynasty was a very minor dynasty. It basically stemmed from an obscure Carolingian count that we not of, of of whom we neither know the name. That back when they had settled there in Saxony, and among the, the for, from the female line that they descended from, actually from Widukind, <laughs> the one who had opposed the imperial grandeur. And and this dynasty, I mean the the Carolingian in, the invasion of Saxony, and and therefore the imperial model, and therefore this family, however had to stress, in many ways, its legitimization, in, in some ways. And also interesting, because um, what you have in the Carolingian Empire is that that was obviously a, a much um, more, uh, at least for, for a while, a, a much more functional thing, um, because Carolingian armies effectively conquered, like, half of Europe. Um, the, 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 the Saxons, the times of the Etonians, didn't. They, ama they managed to do something that was amazing for those times, but that has to be contextualized, in fact, on the base of, of the resources they had. I mean, the Carolingians, when they were crowned emperors, they really, um, uh, you know, they, they didn't quite care about getting a true ideological... Uh, support to their power. I mean, obviously they did when the papacy could sign from their side, but they still had the strength of arms under their command. Um, so they they didn't quite care. I mean, instead, in Antonian Germany, the problem is that 
the, the base was very narrow and therefore they had to develop even a certain ideology and political theory that in fact stressed this concept of the Renovatio Imperi of the idea that now a true empire was reborn in some ways. Even this is not really um, so clear because I mean the fact that, that the Holy Roman Empire was founded in 962 uh, etc. is just a modernistic uh, and, and gross uh, approximation devoid of any real uh, evidence. I mean, the empire was exactly the same one uh, of Charlemagne. Uh, that that's what the empire had been. The, the Ottonians do not uh, recover anything. That had all the imperial thing had always been there. There were uh, other been other um, contenders to, to to imperial crown. Uh, to control the, uh, to revive the empire, and all this stuff, and it's they they didn't add anything to that. Even the same name, Holy Roman Empire, is also something appears in the 12th century. It is 300 years later. This was something very different, but um, in uh, only if you see it, in fact, from the the new bases on which it was founded, that were effectively the ones that tied together the destinies of Germany and Italy at that point. Um, that, that remained what we commonly think of, of the Holy Roman Empire in, in, in that axis. That, however, doesn't take into consideration that theoretically the whole rest, at least of Western Christendom, was part of the empire. I mean, on the maps of medieval Europe, do you see, you see the Holy Roman Empire, Germany and Italy, and then you see France that is another thing. And you say, well, you may think that it was external. No, really not. Really not. Because there were times, even Spanish, French kings that tried to be appointed emperors in the Middle Ages that, you know, had this, uh, and naturally th th there were others into within the, 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 the former Carolingians held territories that were actually appointed even emperors uh, in, in to Italy and uh, think about Bohemia that is annexed now uh, under the Ottonian times at least l loosely. Um, and eventually was integrated into the empire. So this is particularly important even in terms of perspectives. But going back to German society, to Eastern Frankish society to be more precise, you see that what happens is the Vassalatic beneficiary system starts very timidly, um, very weakly because it has a few material bases to expand. Um, the um, the, the, the in Germany there aren't the, the hugely fertile valleys in you know, France etc where you can build this great f feudal um, um, clientels because society is not stratified in Germany it's pl it's plenty of rough um, you know um, fighter freemen let's say that that that, that look at their um, at their freedom as a normal datum of their political existence, let's say, and they, 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 they're not to give up. And it's not that they are, that th this is a, a merit, it's simply that that society was not fit for cre creating larger clientels, like in a Vassalatic beneficiary system, um, it, it was possible, right? And that's why feudalism is born in northern France and not somewhere else. And uh, so, in other words, it's not much the strength of freemen as such that it is, but it's the weakness of the of feudalism that uh, cannot counter the, the freemen, at least in in large ways. So, in Germany, this, the the feudal, the vassalatic social engineering takes its um, takes another path from the rest of um, of of Europe. Um, uh, in this sense, so here, um, so Germany, in uh, in itself, we will look even at we could look at surrounding areas because, by the way, it's it's even very difficult to uh, to to identify Germany. There is nothing like Germany now. It, it's um, it's exactly towards this ninth and tenth centuries that some monasteries so this, the, the the idea of Germany was born fundamentally from this ecclesiastical elites um, as, as a political body you know start to say okay we're part of this broader kingdom that has enucleated, has enucleated itself through the various vicissitudes of post Carolingian times um, or Carolingian post Carolingian times that we can start calling the Teutonic Kingdom 
that was the the idea and then that's what it was the synecdoche also sometimes through which everybody who was part of this kingdom was was called like like the tel because of the teuton as the ancient uh, the ancient it actually derives from the Teutchen, the 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 Deutsche, the the the, the, the idea of, of, of people. Mm. Uh the Teutici as uh, in Latin were called. So um there was in fact even in the root of the name you see this very strong um uh, uh let's say popular character of this area. It was that conceived itself chiefly because of the, of the the freedom of their of their men fundamentally. Um from from a political and juridical point of view, because actually at this time what really defines an ethnicity is law. When you're talking about ethnicities at this time, it, it's not about you know what you look like, but rather more or less under which law um, you are, and obviously also in the sense which language you speak, because most of the times this even in post Carolingian Germany, you know everything was oral in terms of even of juridical traditions etc so um think about this even from in terms of civil progress i mean how difficult it was even to build something like an administration to have a an effective government that could control everything it was basically impossible and obviously policy uh was you know the, the political power was found was founded in part in this on this meager um uh, measures to say that a uh, meager power that could be given by the you know owning some land from the ancient uh, vassalatic uh, you know order and starting privately to develop to capitalize upon it and progressively extend their power just how th th that's just how the Ottonians expanded their power but it was very loose and very weak and that's the reason why Germany has an elective monarchy and up to the 12th century basically doesn't have anything really more uh you know that 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 at least could achieve a sort of monarchical centralization then eventually it fails anyway but that's another story for now s stopping to 10th century germany all we can do is that in this region it is also quite diverse let's be honest there are areas that are kind of more developed than others the rhineland because of roman domination is and fertile soil, etc. It's it's more developed, and it's always been. Um, even the south of Germany. I mean, Germany at this point is larger than than the than the Roman. Uh, the, I mean, the ancient times, because the Germans have crossed, they've gone south of the Danube. The south of the Danube had been a r part of the Roman Empire. So even in there, there are more cities. It's usually a wealthier area. South of Germany has always been historically at that point wealthier than the north that was really rough and it, but, but simply because you know take the the geographical evidence of the thing think about for medieval technology what it meant to live just in a in a colder climate like the one of saxony than living in places like swabia right it, it's 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 really different it really makes a lot of difference different landscapes different climates different peoples with which you you interact different uh, you know, uh, contact with civilization. There is this greater um, datum that you can take that is fundamentally, you know, that, that during the Middle Ages, civilization develops in places where civilization had been closer. There is nothing to do about that, and that's why, you know, it takes so much time for places like Northern Europe or Eastern Europe to develop more than what essentially w what we define as Western Europe proper today actually was. I mean, if you look at, at the data, especially in the, the very end of the Middle Ages, the thresholds of modern age, you realize that. And interestingly enough, Germany has this ability to progressively fall into the, the Western half, even though uh, this, the, there is also this uh, eminently middle European dimension that is this broader Central Europe that. In fact, it's very difficult to even identify because there is there are no physical boundaries in Central Europe. I mean, from from the the Western uh, uh, German the German uh, Western German forests to 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 the steppe. I mean, it's a huge uh, uh, amount of land that has no and and this had been particularly important even in terms of military culture because uh, Germany is now we. As moderns, we 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 obviously look at today's Germany and say, oh well, that's kind of a well, 
Western, solidly developed and rich country, etc. So it's part of the club of, of the Western cool guys, right? But back in the day, the situation was uh, very, very, uh, very different in the sense that um, there was no, after the migration era, that culture of the steppe, even this kind of semi-nomadic mindset had lived all along. Germany is a country where you can find the um, the, the Draconis standards that, that the Sarmatians used back in the, the steppes but in, in the ancient world, like up to the 13th century. When you realize that you can't truly really differentiate a uh, this this population sometimes, especially the, the eastern. You you go towards the 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 steps with with those peoples who dwell in there. Um, you can't see. I, I would like to deepen much this because it also has to do strictly what the, with the military theme and with the idea of knighthood as it has dealt. I'm a great great supporter of the idea that basically uh, medieval knighthood is something that stems and it's deeply rooted into the Indo-European uh, steps more than anything else there is no me uh, technologistic approach of things like you know m modern uh, you know the European medieval uh, medieval European knighthood originates from you know the the Persian cataphracts it's, it's not how that happened it's not about how you wear it it's about the mindset it's about the culture it's about the the, the environment right and and simply the, the regions of central and eastern Europe were wild were savage they had a lifestyle that requ had required for millennia the fact that, that you couldn't really uh, leave much of what the land offered you had to, to move to be ready to to raid to take action because the local resources the local surplus was was not enough nothing to do with the Mediterranean nothing to do with places like Gaul uh, or even other regions uh, that weren't quite developed but held they had a kind of a stabilized sanitary culture like take Anglo-Saxon England certain regions uh, uh, of Spain obviously Italy but just to also if you go eastwards it's like the same but um, the this world had rem rem maintained um, it's very strongly this kind of warrior like tribal like um, char military character right and it had also to do with uh, fighting on horseback right so even if Germany has never been a great uh, place for cavalry uh, especially in its western most forested areas um, it, it was still a place where the, the warrior mindset survived right so there is also this great detachment that you can do between the ideal of the warrior of the Aryan warrior and the the actual um, uh, you know chivalry as we mean it also in more primitive sense of not in the courtly one that eventually was developed later um, because you can still have that mindset if still if you, even if you can't go on horseback uh, or very very easily because the land is, is terrible in fact Germany would always maintain for for many centuries actually it, this very strong infantry is actually um, think about even the defeats think about Zunta the, the one of the uh, uh, few but a great uh, Carolingian defeats uh, come at the hand of, of, of the Saxons in Westphalen, uh, where Carolingian cavalry was chopped down. Um, and it's, by the way, the only the single Carolingian battle that we can uh, we can analyze tactically speaking, because about the other ones we basically n know absolutely anything about their their development. Um, but if you look at 10th, uh, 11th, and 12th century Germany, you see that that infantry are still pretty strong. And sometimes even uh, knights dismount incredibly often. Actually, than more than in other countries, where even just for a geographical reason, it was it was easier to fight on horseback, right? For because of terrain or because of the general. But uh, more importantly, it was also because a uh, a knightly elite, a feudal class, you know, took really a lot of time to be developed because simply there were no resources they were too poor uh, to make the long story short and therefore they were something closer to the ancient warrior that 
maybe it wasn't that in fact great uh, military development that it was, but in that particular environment, it was very tough to to cope with, right? In militarily speaking, so as we have seen in in Germany and especially in certain regions, the st and 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 bear in mind that. Saxony is exactly the, 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 the worst of all places in Germany at this point, and it's even more meaningful in, in many ways that that's where the Ottonians started from, right? Because, like, the, the most Frankicized and imperial like uh, land in Germany was, was Franconia, actually, in the very center between the, the, the Germany the, towards the, the west, the, the Rhine, the, the Main rivers, this area was kind of even more fertile, more connected, let's say, to others, they had, there was more wealth. In fact, Ottonian Germany, basically, a, a, the Ottonian power is is a sum of Saxon and Franconian uh, clientels, basically. The rest also roughly escapes, aside from, you know, even when the, the you know, parallel branch of the Ottonians is settled in Bavaria, it is this very vaguely, uh, you know, uh, describable area, ge geographically speaking, that they're still far away, right? Um, so, in this land, overall, on average, um, the social structures had kept themselves in a, a much more statically um, fateful way to the Germanic origins. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, the, um, let's say, the division, the difference between the the gap between the the freemen and the um uh in in say of the freemen into knights and rustics fundamentally had not really taken place so you know that even in carolingian society in frankish society originally everybody was was a freeman right but there is an incredibly um fast social certification in gold when the franks settled down we have talked about this extensively and if you go into the Frankish history playlist you can find a lot of that. So basically even if nobody had really decided this and it was not juridically um, evident the um, the uh, well, it was not juridically formalized, excuse me, the difference between the, the horsemen the nobility, the aristocracy and the rest of the freemen was pretty marked right? So that the first ones came to rule, especially in this seigneurial phase, post Carolingian, but it was already started in Carolingian times, over these masses of, of rustics that, in theory, on paper, even if there had been, <laughs> because there wasn't still, but and especially where there were many that could write, and uh, would write things down, um, were freemen, but as a matter of fact, were just like serfs, right? So in Germany, this is instead very different because the knights, the milites, as they were called, and the rustici, the rustics, the peasants, uh, the peasantry, w were not clearly defined, right? Or at least they were much closer than than in other. Uh, actually, I think in all than in any other post carolingian territory, right? Because um, Feudalism, in a way or another, starts everywhere, but nowhere like in Germany. This is so loose. Mm -hmm. So, um, at, at the same time, even the political interest into developing the vassalatic beneficiary system wa um, wa was pretty was much less evident, let's say, than the Western Frankish kingdom, right? So, because evidently the who wanted to rule in this world couldn't just say, well, okay, um, you know, I, I imagine that in the future we will develop like a feudal society. Nobody actually, you know, they, they were very contingently oriented in these choices. They they obviously understood the, um, especially the higher aristocracy had perfectly in Burlington understood all the advantages posed by the vas vassalatic beneficiary system that in part was exactly what uh, the the German elites had lacked. The Germanic elites had lacked up to that point in terms of of political, institutional, juridical justification for getting rid of the freeman class and ruling like like a lord. Uh, but at the same time, they they still lacked the basis to, to to draw sources to do that. So even if if they, they if these lords wanted to rule, they needed the freeman. They needed this 
uh, you know, more uh, autonomous uh, military element that evidently was uh, was not so willing, or obviously, well, no, nowhere it was willing, you know, nobody was willing to, to be oppressed, let's say, but that, however, could oppose more resistance in proportion to this um, um, social engineering uh, process, right? So the allowed, so the, the free property, um, uh, remained actually very widespread. That is to say that, yes, this was a poorer world, but at least somewhere there was a peasant who could work by himself, have his own house, and not to have uh, an oppressive nobleman that would ask him so many exactions, like it was starting to, to happen in places like uh, in like France. There is also another reason for this, that it is, um, Germany was less attractive even for raiders. Uh, this might sound strange, given that fact that the hungers, for uh, for example, well, are <laughs> you know kind of the most important reason why uh, even figures like Henry the uh, Fowler or Otto the, the First were managed to to expand their power, the political power, uh, through the, the reconstitution of a military force that was to 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 function for for the whole kingdom, but um, the still the idea is that um, this was not a very appealable land you know it was tough it was people who lived there were were rough the ter the terrain was was it was was bad uh the the weather was was like you know you know maybe for a biking it wasn't that worse uh, of course but you know it's like with the one Tacitus talks about the Germans says that fundamentally they're less mixed than others because nobody no other people had ever thought to go live in such a hell of a place like Germany because it, 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 it's extremely rough to do there but this f favors so in proportion it's not that the the freemen lived so better than in places like France or Italy this is something you can extend even to Scandinavia when uh, when you say oh well the Viking society was a better one it was intrinsically more egalitarian yes, it was more egalitarian because everybody was more equally poor. That's wh what the point is. It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, the fact that there was a kingship uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, so kind of an oligarchic system that was more pronounced really made people so necessarily oppressed or uh, however having a lower quality of lives. At this time, obviously, the French, the Italians lived way better than they lived in places like like Scandinavia, but it's pretty obvious. Um, the only point is that um, these processes uh, are also tied to a higher cinetic energy that is channeled to, you know, crush someone else. That is to say, that um, the, the the there is um, even a further de degree of acceleration, even by wealth, that brings to this progressive cer certification, if you want. And, and also here, the, 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 the differences are astonishing because at this point, the, the degree of, of social certification that already exists in the Western Frankish kingdom is, uh, is, is present nowhere else in, in, in Europe. Um, in, for instance, in the Longobard kingdom, it was completely different than this. Uh, freemen were kind of you know, better off, but that they were the richest in absolute terms, but they, they in, in there, for example, in the Italic Kingdom, the Carolingian structures evolve, uh, surely, uh, you know, at, at least uh, at the beginning, in a kind of a mm, probably more consistent way than was the, what Germany uh, saw at the, at the very beginning, right? So this is important. Um, and in fact, at the end of the day, if you look at on the long run, what happens into Germany is that although the, there is this kind of egalitarian ethos, at the end of the day, with uh, a lot of uh, effort, um, uh, the vassalatic beneficiary system really, and the fe feudalism uh, at, at one point ta takes over because also the freemen do not have this extraordinary wealth like in other places in Europe, right? So it takes more time, but it's still kind of, you know, Germany transformed by the 14th century it's a fully feudal and princely um, area so all this premise is particularly important because we have to get to, uh, to in, in order to understand the the knightly 
um, element as such because now we haven't been talking much of how uh, knighthood was developing in other in other kingdoms but let's say that the um, th there were um, two types uh, th also in here in Germany w there was a military proper you know a knightly model devil right and there were fundamentally also in here the senores and the bassi right in latin so it's the senior and the bassus um and among the bassi right there were essentially of two types the um the casati that is to say the ones who had fundamentally tenures uh, uh properties on their own um, and the so-called baccalari or haustaldi that is a bit like the the huscarl you know the 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 one who lives basically under a senior right so under a lord in his own abode that could be naturally at this time as you can imagine a molten bailey castle with you know other land and that that also had this eminently um you know, uh, familiar relation with the the, the the senior, familiar in the sense not that they were relatives, but that they lived with the senior, that they made up his bodyguard, they fought alongside him, and so on. So the whole deal of feudalism, as you know, is that you, the, the idea is that the public power um, and later in this total privatization that takes, uh, I mean, not, not always completely total, but large pri privatization that that starts spreading post Carolingian Europe. Um, there is a leader, however, let's put it in this way, can be the, the emperor, the king, the, the, the local lord, and maybe even someone else's vassal, is, uh, uh, of course, because it's always the king that rules in that sense. But however, that gives you some land. And so you become his vassus, and you have this land, because not because, you know, that guy wanted to give it to you, but because he... The, there weren't many other means to control the land and this contract was made in the sense that okay I give you the land and then you fight basically for me with the resources that you can uh, draw from that land which in, in a modern perspective it, it sounds ridiculous in the sense that it's obvious that the, the, the guy once he gets the, the, the land says okay I get the money which is what that the, the equivalent of and 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 goodbye, but I think it was more complicated at the time because everything was so fragmented, politically speaking, military speaking. That even though, um, of course, from your own land you could uh, rule basically as a lord on your own because you had some rights connected even to what you could ask to exact from the local population in that land, etc. You were still, you know, looking what was the, the favorable clientele to be under. Um, that is to say, you could side either with the king or with that other vassal. You could, let's say, however, be part of a system that was constantly conflictual. First of all, first of all, so you were constantly under threat, and you had necessarily to choose which allegiance you you had to um, to 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 give, because that could simply equate from you know living or dying, right? Uh, which meant that you had to go on fighting so that you couldn't just entrench yourself, you know, and it's not that simple, even militarily speaking, to your, your castle. Sometimes it happened, actually, that's why this is the moment of great expansion of encastellation, but what really the whole thing was about was putting, to, this was investing, let's put it in these terms, um, your own wealth into being actually a military professional, professional war that at that time meant to, to fight on horseback with uh, armor and uh, sword and to go out there with many other knights actually well not so many maybe now we will we will eventually read the Indiculus Loricatorum this is fantastic um, but you uh, and, and fighting alongside them so having even this sense so other people were basically in your own same condition so at the end of the day, this difference between the Vassi Casati and the Vassi uh, Baccalari or Austaldi, as they were called, um, came in a certain sense to, 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 not really to disappear completely, but let's say to form 
a sort of new class because basically there were men of free condition right that um, found themselves to share the same type of office and, and lifestyle actually with the seigneurial armed uh, forces that were of servile condition um, so this is particularly important because in perspective you can see it a bit like this always bearing in mind that it's approximated is that you know the the free um, um, the, the the free element let's say remained fundamentally more sympathetic towards this non feudal non vassalitic way of, of life right but saying that basically I'm free I don't have to render uh, you know I don't have to respond to anyone fundamentally and uh, if I put myself under a lord it's because I still maintain my own uh, neg bargaining power in many ways but so, uh, as a consequence so there were definitely free knights and there would always be but still there was a, a greater amount of people who instead was a serf um, that preferred actually to go to work um, under a lord that in this sense was where you know the greatest wealth was being um, uh, stored right because these were you know as weak as it could be even the vassalitic beneficiary system in Germany entailed that uh, you know the more power was concentrated into the hands of few the, the the Carolingian you know conquest had not gone really without any impact on Eastern uh, Frankish society obviously it it it, it was um, it was pretty evident so it's as if more preferably the knightly class in Germany and especially the, the vassalitic beneficiary knightly class it is the, the, those knights that fought for the Lord under the Lord were not freemen but they were serfs mm -hmm. and this is not really um, I mean I eventually we will learn how the German knighthood up to essentially the 14th century excluded uh, was a servile class yes the, 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 the really the characteristics of German knighthood is that they were not freemen that they were serfs mm -hmm. you don't find it elsewhere in you know all the various uh, knights in, in the rest of Europe all had kind of their own it's a national if we can call it like that characteristic the German one was they were non freemen right and Actually, in, in, in the later uh, centuries, this would get into, especially during the 13th, you re realize that the um, servile military class of Germany were had gained uh, a great power on its own, so that they basically lived at that point already as well as, um, as the other noblemen, actually. And there were actually at that time, especially in regions like southern Germany, were evidently that a greater social certification was was greater so that the 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 the, the uh, vassalitic model had managed to attract more of these serfs the the ministeriales because this was actually the name of this knight's serfs were like 90 percent of the whole amount amount of of, of cavalrymen you, you could of, of knights proper actually you could find on, on the battlefield right but we are in the 13th century this one is like in an embryonal phase right but still there is that characteristic that you don't find elsewhere although although uh, this is in general that is to say that generally speaking this happens more in Germany than any anywhere else Al in other countries however post Carolingian countries, you still have serfs that technically can become knights, right? But at that point, it's um, it, it's different. That there is a um, in that case, there is a much more evident uh, social um, rise. You know, um, I mean, a, a kind of a, um, a rise in, in the social ladder because at that point becoming a knight or lord equated to be really powerful so that nobody could really contest you the fact that you were you had or you or your ancestors had not been freemen and then maybe just for working uh, on behalf of a lord you had become one 
you know. Uh, it was plain, much of the uh, European nobility actually stemmed from, from, I mean, not excessively much, uh, in Germany evenly, but in, in other countries it happened to consistently in some form that they stemmed from, from serfs, so f from people that originally were not freemen. So from the, the what would have been considered by a freeman the scum of society. I mean, the 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 revolt of uh, of Stendinger was, for example, a case where, you know, freemen and freedmen joined, not because they liked much each other, but because they could combine their force against the the emergence of uh, the emergence of a of an aristocracy that could flatten them down <laughs> at the level of serfs, both both of them, but. Uh, you know, the, the the idea of freedom was attached to the idea that, that that it's not based on the freedom of human beings. It's based on the freedom of, of your as your prerogative, won by blood or by con or right of conquest. And back in the day, the, this con the, this people were like people's head, and and the serfs or the slaves were just non-human beings. Um, and especially in these regions of Europe that were kind of superficially Christianized, you know, that was all the more evident. Uh, that so it, it, that's why I I was um, kind of making you aware that yeah we can talk about egalitarianism egalitarianism even of democracy in some ways with all these public assemblies and all, but everything was decided. But it's not that these people give a, gave a damn about the freedom of someone who was out outside of their own group they absolutely <laughs> didn't wouldn't and they they were actually living in, normally to seize each other's uh freedom in this sense because you know uh, it, it's it's the myth of the good savage you know the idea that before the terrible conqueror rise everybody lives happily and and peacefully uh, tribal societies in, in proportion were way more violent and, and radically violent in the deepest roots of their culture uh, and way more than was was happening elsewhere where obviously they were capable of making more damage because they were m more powerful but at least they had some idea of you know that maybe there is a better world <laughs> that you can you know where everybody is you know that there is justice uh, egality in the sense even that goes beyond um public justice, right? Even thinking about the Christian message in itself is very powerful under this point of view. In this world, it was simply the norm. Nobody really cared. Society worked like that, and there were reasons for which it had evolved in that fashion, anthropologically speaking, and that's how it lived. So that's why it's also extremely debatable to look upon the, the, the conquests of these populations and saying, you know, ah, those were just poor, they, they sold slaves each, each other, like you know, every time they 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 conquer each other, so it, it's and the slavery exists and it's in here as well. I mean, even post Carolingian times, there were slaves, and these were, you know, nominally Christianized uh, lands. It, it, it was very normal, but even in other places, it were slaves. Of course, uh, even in f much more fully Christianized and developed societies. So we have to be able to look very transversally into this without um, idealizing or pretending that we study these epochs in history because you say, oh, look, this is the, the team, my team, those are my ancestors, they're cool guys. No, there were a bunch of rapers, uh, killers, and robbers. That That's what their life was about. But civilization passed through that as well. That is the astonishingly amazing thing, that... And that, in spite of all, these people managed to build up the civilization in which we live. And we should start to, to get acquainted to this perspective that is that not uh, everything that, you know, sometimes I hear people that, the other day there was one guy commenting on that video I made, for example, on Albrecht von Wallenstein. This guy wrote something like, oh, but this guy wrote once that he had to assassinate, he sent assassins to kill people. Like, so it's not good. And, and, and so what, sh what? You shouldn't s study about Albrecht von Wallenstein? Because you idiot, you don't even know that he actually slaughtered thousands of people for that matter. <laughs> you just didn't send assassins out there. Obviously not. Because our history, our civilization passes through that as well. And these were figures that we have to know, because otherwise, what do you do? 
you don't talk about things in history because people killed each other so you talk you don't talk about caesar because he slaughtered 300,000 goals what what's the point and turn into slavery another million no, like you know what's the deal with that um that's how stupid people really can get and and it's shocking to to observe how this how obviously it's motivated these people simply don't know history there is not much to do about it but the problem is that we are in 2019 in two countries that are supposedly to be supposed to be developed or educated uh, schooled and people don't even know their own history this is disgusting frankly and uh, that's one of the most uh, we should eradicate uh, this kind of uh, ignorance i believe that's one of you know civil duties we have in many ways um so at the end of the day what we were talking about is that there is this gefolgschaft right so this a uh, retinue of um of of soldiers of of uh, you can't say soldiers in the sense that they were paid effectively to fight in some way usually the especially those who lived into the seigneurial uh, household were um you know there was this kind of criterion of redistribution that was something very old actually you don't have to to write the Basilic beneficiary system to have even in back in the in tribal times the leader was effectively the one who stored part of the loot to to redistribute it to keep his own to balance let's say the equipment of his own retinue and all this stuff so um in this retinue there, there is a kind of a, a new human type right that progressively from the mix of this uh mostly servile and part of freeman kind of created another that that kind of surpassed the old political and juridical divisions right um because that's where the private retinue gets formed mm? this is important that paradoxically um the the concept of, of because one of the greatest problems of Carolingian societies had been the lack of public authority you know the the, the Carolingian the Frankish world was completely devoid of the concept that there had to be a public good in terms of property of state uh, you know of est estatal estates or something like that it was everything belonged nominally individually personally to the king and this was absolutely different from the germanic mindset back in the day and as we have seen not really because uh those germans actually cared about that but because it was basically the balance of, of society who was checking for you know this or that aristocrat not to get too powerful to take over power and take away power from the various um freemen which is in turn by the way what 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 aristocrats were doing exactly at this time towards the kings so you realize that uh it, it really depends on simply on where you stand on the social ladder the, the the dynamics are exactly the same right but this um new retinues were private in the sense that they belong to that strongly private world that was the feudal one right or at least was i i know that vassalatic beneficiary is something now that will pour out of your ears because i re i repeat it so much but that actually the the right term because if i say feudal it seems as if you know the feudal there are people out there who even pretend that feudalism kind of did not exist because they have been told that it's outdated as a term feudalism did exist and uh, but this wasn't quite the one we're talking about that's why vassalatic beneficiary is it's basically another way to say it was a clientelary system that would evolve into feudalism right but with this specific um uh let's say dynamic of the senior that entrusts the uh, the vassus with uh, the beneficium and then uh, on the base of this the vassus were swears an oath of allegiance to the lord in order to help them on the base of the wealth that he has gotten from that beneficium so that's exactly what the, the thing is but it's very private and you realize it was a, a really a free contract that's how it how it, it it began historically speaking uh it already existed since late roman times it it, it partly existed um even in, in in the germanic world in some in some ways the same term field basically comes from germanic in their case it had to do with cattle uh you know uh, 
in, ca in case of the Romans, it was with owning, you know, land. So <laughs> different societies, different beneficium in this sense. But um, the the concept is fundamentally the same, and it's a way clientele societies really work like you know, everywhere. Um, so uh, there has been a lot of debate, because, in my opinion, because first of all we know a very few about the creation of this class. I mean, it's not that you can really look into ninth or to tenth century Germany and understanding clearly what's going on, because it's grossly underdocumented um, to really understand everything clearly. But but there is someone hmm, who has wanted to see a sort of uh, medium, a uh, trait d'union between the German ministeriales of the Carolingian era and the ministeriales of the feudal age in Germany. And, and the, this medium would be the Caballari, that is basically this group of ministeriales that served on horseback as messengers. Right. And there is a book that talks about this it, from uh, Nietzsche, which is uh, Ministerialität und Bürgertum. Mm. Um, in, it's very old, but still can be interesting to read. And um, basically, so we, we, we talked about the Ministeriales as this class of uh, uh, servile knights in, into uh, the high and low Middle Ages in Germany, but who were the ones of the Carolingian times we just mentioned? Well, s essentially they were, um, uh, you know, the, the the ministerialis is a word in Latin that basically means uh, those were deputed to, to the lesser things, like uh, it's like administration. Basically, means at minus at at the smaller things. And and therefore, these were you understand what the, the word serfs generally because they were those who uh, really had to perform some duties for someone else that was obviously someone higher in the social ladder at least, and and sometimes they were simply administrators for real. I mean, there was not even necessarily a a uh, civil, um, I mean, a, a military um, nature of their service. They were mostly, they could be even, even civilians in, in the, naturally in the Middle Ages, the, the, the difference between civilian and, 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 and military men is, is loose, but um, the the concept is that they could be serfs, so those who didn't fight really on horseback like knights, right? And this served on horseback, so the the caballari obviously means those who, who, uh, who operate on horseback at least. But but this interpretation so that thinking that the the, the German ministerialis actually emerges this massive class into twelfth thirteenth century Germany for uh or from from eleventh thirteenth century Germany just because in Carolingian times there had been someone who was called Caballari and was also a ministerialis, it's kind of you know, it, even if there was that connection which is which is Possible in some cases, I don't really know, but um, only when you talk about the the ministeriales broadly meant, not the, specifically the caballari, because you know it, it, I hardly find even a an actual uh, way of defining what a, what a caballari is at this point. I mean, you can literally take every serf that can go on horseback has a certain stamina that can run with his horse to to, me to send messages. You know, and the, the, there there surely was some kind of um, you know organization that, as we say, uh, we were saying, was pretty homogeneous, even in post Carolingian times, because all the uh, society was now being ordered in more or less in, in a similar fashion. But there is no real real connection um, um, that you can prove. First of all, because first of all, this group was probably very narrow, right? Um, the and even though if you take the word rita, um, you can see in this uh, so the, the what would be mm, in, in eventually the the German word to to qualify uh, a knight basically, um, you could um, say that the, the word um, 
uh, is, uh, is is comes from uh, Ritan that in in the in, in the ancient like, Ritan actually to to, to write the, you find even into Anglo-Saxon old Icelandic like uh, Ridare Ridari etc. Uh, that's where writer comes from. Actually means to effectively to to travel to run. Hmm? And to ride in this sense on horseback, so it could seem as if th this was a confirmation of the hypothesis etymologically speaking. But actually, um, the term "ritter" in German is um, that also has this um, actual older southern "ritter" um, is a kind of a um, imitation, let's say, uh, uh, an equivalency, at least not linguistically, but in terms of meaning and of symbol, actually, um, to the uh, French uh, chevalier. Mm -hmm. um, that I is obviously connected with the verb reiten, that is to, to, to go on horseback, to ride, but it's still you know, too few to tell that what passes in here into fundamentally half of a millennium history is simply traceable in the absence of any other historical evidence to, you know, the etymology of a word. Uh, it's very risky to say it best. So, let's say that probably the process took other other paths and how it happened. Um, probably it's really the attract, I mean, at least this is my interpretation and I don't really know whether it's true or is correct or not, but the fact that, in this sense, the the Freeman class was stronger into Germany, and that the, all the serfs would preferably put themselves under a a lord that was at least the best Freeman in terms of wealth and and power and future, if you want, is is could really work. I mean, compared to other countries of post-colonial Europe, yeah, that that can work. I mean, that was a way to make a living for a serf. Right, and and because of this dynamics, it's possible in Germany this process was more accentuated, and and that's I believe that a, a fairly structural explanation of why German knights are serfs into the High Middle Ages, and or, or at least that this club. Because by the way, I should I should say that um, the I think the, the most explicit mentions uh, of 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 ministerialis at least as true knights are something that happened a little later, like from the reign of uh Conrad the Second. And um and and eventually um they they keep expanding. So initially probably this number of serfs wasn't really that big, but at the same time in same Germany um knights weren't that widespread at least as fighters as mounted troops like so that, that infantry the, the infantry of freeman had still this substantial strength so that maybe we don't see we, we see the ministeriales growing as in number and in importance be, as in parallel with the spread of feudalism proper into germany that is uh, as we said it's something that happens very late in time the second half of the 12th century basically um and that's where in fact the the serfs spread. And by the way, this is an extremely um, convenient uh, way for the aristocracies to sp to create their military retinues because they don't have to ask that service to any freemen. It's simply the serfs who poor under their uh, protect uh, protective wing and they become... In fact, ministerialists, interestingly enough, were extremely widespread into the ecclesiastical armies. Interestingly enough, so this is um, um, this was a way really to administrate. Uh, you know, there is a type of warrior, a fighter, at least that that is to be found where th there is a higher degree of privatization, right? So in these islands, in these isles of 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 private power, that in fact e ecclesiastical do dominions were, because especially under you know, under Ottonian times, um, the the Ottonians basically get the support chiefly from the ecclesiastical elites in exchange for letting them do whatever they like and even play part of this included expanding their domains attracting other people and also having this uh, greater ability to um to to 
to create sort sort of of of, of uh, private regions out of out of nowhere, let's say. So, I find this very um, very fascinating, at least. So, in looking at the spread of this uh, servile night, um, you see that. Um, the the appearance that uh, that really starts to make a difference is under Henry the Fowler, right? Um, at least this is um, an instrument that the Ottonians start to use in their turn as well, and this happens in part uh, also for for other reasons that are intertwined with the military history of Germany at that time that have to do obviously with the threat posed by the uh, the hungers, right? So. Germany gets hit very hard, actually, by the hungers. We often forget, we, we like, obviously, to emphasize that the Vikings or the Saracens did a lot of damage, but it turns out that those regions were still kind of more, you know, able to recover, at least quickly, and they partly uh, entered into a kind of a broader circuit that was, you know, even, you know, economical, etc. With, with the hungers into Central Europe, it was really like, you know, uh, consider that Germany was, as we described it before, not extremely productive, wealthy. So, where these guys would hit, you know, it would take even more to, to reshape everything, to, to rebuild everything. And, and the hunger threat was really imposed, and so imposed, in fact, that brought the German ability to actually stick together and say, okay, let's abandon for one s our traditional uh you know autonomism and let's create let's appoint a king that actually has some military capability that can deal with this threat because it's too damaging that's how the Ottonians rise to power um and the under especially under the the, the younger threat Henry the Fowler gave a great importance to the so called Milites Agrari. So the Milites Agrari basically means uh, knights uh, slash um, uh, agriculturers, basically slash. Uh, can't really say peasants because that's not the concept. But these are at least knights that are uh, that still connected with the the, the agricultural work and entrepreneurial uh, reality, etc. That have a uh, kind of you know heavy enough equipment and that they are mm, kept to pers uh, to defend to to guard the fortified centers f f founded by the king right um and in among these um militias there were also many other warriors that were recruited in the most diverse ways actually and 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 these troops were evidently conceived with at least a nucleus of heavy cavalry that was quite important not just because now in Carolingian po in this case in post Carolingian Europe heavy cavalry had now gained uh, quite quite of an importance its own momentum in the tactical developments etc. Uh, but also because the mounted force was needed to to increase the strategical mobility against fast moving enemies right they were not just the hungers they were also the slavs by the way um and it it's this heavy cavalry created by the Ottonians that manages to subdue bohemia at least in in, in part and to attract it further towards the the, the germanic orbit and uh, you know that Henry the Fowler launches uh, campaigns against the the, the, the Polabians and the Bohemians. Uh, Henry the Second would launch uh, campaigns against uh, the Poland. Uh, so there was this idea that also Germany, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, was not really well defined from from a in terms of geographical boundaries. That there were still these populations were partially fluid. That is to say, not that they were still now they had settled chiefly the, the, at least the major ethnic groups were now quite geographically defined but still they, they were 
synetic and they were evolving and, and part of the reason why they, they were like that is that in fact they lacked a kind of solidly hierarchical system that could order everything and also in part freeze a bit like in Cold War the, the more you uh, the, the higher the, the deterrent is the, the more military operations tend to freeze uh, because you fear that, that it's not always like this but obviously on, on average uh, uh, you know, the more unitary one state is, and the more its forces get dispersed, dispersed all, all around. Um, and the reason, so it, it's naturally this: the creation of a ninthly class takes a while, right? Because it's it's difficult because it goes along with the construction of new castles, of the deforestation of lands, the drying of swamps, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, even cleansing of enemy entities like the, the, the colonization towards the east also passes through the annihilation of many tribes of many peoples that gets massacred around the way, the way. so uh, it's a lot, really a lot of work and what you see in, into this is that the creation of an asset is very very important even for the political future of your um, of your dynasty. In the case of the Ottonians this is particularly evident. Henry the Fowler is the one that uh, builds a lot of castles, strengthens this s political relations, and Otto the First, that is being more celebrated historically speaking, also because he had the, the, he achieved the greatest results. It's a bit like F Alexander the Third with uh, Philip the Second. You know, there are these great fathers that um, maybe achieve less than their sons, but still make their their sons able to to achieve what they 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 will. Eventually, and the, in the case of Germany, it's particularly meaningful. The same happened with Frederick Barbarossa. His his father was, uh, you know, building a lot of castles, strengthening their domains, and it all all starts from private domains because there is no public power, no public control. So the only way is to restart from the base. And this is particularly interest, uh, particularly uh, meaningful and evident, especially in Germany where this will always kind of be a problem and, and Germany in fact in the greater um, on, on a greater historical uh, scale in terms of, in terms of perspective w will um, see the, the private model uh, even overthrowing the public one the, 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 the timid public one that had been uh, you know attempted at least so it will always start from the private domains. There is something very, very different from a public domain until very late in time, even up to the modern age and the second modern age, uh, um, in, in uh, terms of the creation of centralized state. Um, and there is this amazing document I, w I wanted to talk to you about that I mentioned to you before. Um, that is the Ind Indiculus Loricatorum. So this is a list of all the great vassals of Otto II mm, um, that indicates the number of loricati, that is in Latin the, the armored troops that, that in this case are heavy horsemen um, that have their that have the military duty to serve mm, the, the sovereign. And this is beautiful. You can uh, read it actually from the MGH uh, Constitutiones one, page six hundred thirty-two, six hundred thirty-three. It's it's a very short text. We can read it even now. I, I think I have inserted in here the the, the picture at one point. Um, but let, let's simply read it. So here. I read you here how it is. Basically, this text was found on a page of a 10th century codex, the Bamberg Codex uh, B uh, 3rd 11, once a number 73, containing the works of Augustine. It is dated on internal evidence to 981, when Otto II was already in Italy. Um, the total number of knights contributed by bishops, abbots, and secular nobles are Episcopal contingents 1,081, abbatial contingents 342, and lay contingents 549. 
So here you have an amazing datum that is that shows you how important ecclesiastical contingents were in Ottonian times, um, um, and how uh, and this this is a trend that is set also for other um, for other times in history. For, for example, for that I mean the, the the German monarchy will always more or less be backed by the great um, clergyman of of the empire. Um, Frederick II also launched his campaigns chiefly into Italy, and the, the reason with ecclesiastical contingents, and this is important to understand because the idea is that the the ecclesiastical contingents were, I mean, the ecclesiastical powers were the ones that had more to lose from a fall of the monarchy. So, obviously, they were reluctant, being actually not very different from the other secular lords. Uh, uh, to to send troops, but it also tended to back more the the imperial prerogatives. And since there was always some rebel among the secular uh, princes, they they would always invest into this. And here you have an astonishing datum that the episcopal and abbatial contingents surpass more than double time the number of lay contingents. This is extraordinary. It's almost thrice. It's almost three to one. So basically, those troops were the, the Ottonian armies were mostly composed um, in in, ca in heavy cavalry in dismounted contingents by uh, two to one by ecclesiastical knights. Mm -hmm. And there is also this. If, and now we will read the text. If you read it, uh, note the distinction that is made between sending and leading in person. That is also particularly important. And there is also these various interesting uh, elements to to note in the original organization of, of the document. So let's read it. So here it says, Bishop Herkenbald of Strasbourg should send 100 armored knights. The abbot of Murbach should lead 20 with him. Bishop Balzo of Speyer should send 29. Bishop Ildebrand of Worms should send 40. The abbot of Weissenburg should send 50. The abbot of Lorsch should send 50. The archbishop of Mainz should send 100. The bishop of Köln should send 100. The bishop of Würzburg should send 60. The abbot of Hersfeld should send 40. Count Heribert should lead 30, and the son of his brother should either come with 30 or 40. Magingold and Magingold, uh, with the help of Burkhardt, should lead 30. Conno, son of Duke Conno, should lead 40. From the Dukedom of Alsace, 70 should be sent. Bezzolino, son of Arnusto, should lead 12. Azzolino, son of Rudolf, should send 30. Oddo, brother of Gebizzo, should send 20. Count Hazel should lead 40. The abbot of Ultensis should send 60. Count Guntram should lead 12. Ungar should lead 20. Lord Sicko, brother of the emperor, should lead 20. Otto should lead 40. Since Duke Charles of Lower Lotharingia was left at home as guardian of the homeland, he should send Bozo with 20. The Bishop of Cambrai should send 12. In margin, Albert should lead 30. Geldolf, with the help of the abbots of Inde and Stavlot, should lead 12. Count Dietrich should send his son with 12. Count Ansfred should send 10. Margraves Gottfried and Arnulf, uh, Arnulf should send 40. Son of Count Sicko should lead 30 with him. The Abbot of Prüm should lead 40. The Archbishop of Trier should lead 70. The Bishop of Verdun should lead 60. The Bishop of Toul should send 20. The Archbishop of Salzburg should send 70. The Bishop of Regensburg should send the same number. Abraham, Bishop of Freising, should send 40. Bishop Reginald of Eichstätt should, uh, should lead 50. 
Bishop Albain of Sabionensis should lead 20. The Bishop of the city of Augsburg should lead 100. The Bishop of Constance should send 40. The Bishop of Chur or Chur uh, should send 40. The Abbot of Algensis should lead 60. The Abbot of St. Gall should lead 40. The Abbot of Eloganga should lead 40. The Abbot of Kimbeduna should lead 30. Hmm? So this is an extremely, I mean, you, when you read it, you say, well, but it's boring, it's just a list. Yeah, okay, but this is from 981. We, we don't have anything else about <laughs> this stuff. It's, it's amazing. And it tells you a lot. Now, I will not get into the detail also because I don't have a map here at hand, but, you know, you can start playing with these numbers and, and observe uh, the, the great variety that naturally exists, but I in fact, in the regional organization, this difference between also sending, leading in person, could see the difference even... Uh, you know that originally, at least in Carolingian Europe, the abbots were meant even to, at, at least to get on the battlefield with their own their own troops and then to to go away. They could also not stand there fighting. Most of them would fight. So and always remember that in here, Greece a very when you know we make the distinction between the ecclesiastical and the secular contingents, we are not really we don't really have to think there was a, a, any difference. I mean these were exactly the same type of troops and and and, and the, <laughs> the point is that the, even the same ca uh, the same um, bishops or abbots were just like the counts what do you think a, a german bishop of the 10th century lived like in terms in, in differences from from a secular count they were the, sa the same exact things they were knights uh, the the german ecclesiastical aristocracy was uh, highly militarized and they fought um, and this was uh, not really a German prerogative but definitely it, it, it happened a lot more in Germany than other places partly also because of this um, you know of, of the importance that that, that ecclesiastical um, princes rose to during Ottonian times mm -hmm. because of the same backing that they had given to the monarchy and therefore the power that was you know the the Ottonian Empire was was based on the church that the, uh, on the clergyman that there was uh, you know in Germany in Italy every uh, every accomplishment that the Ottonian armies managed to achieve was thanks to the support of the local clergy because if they hadn't had the support from these elements they would have not able been able to control anything these guys controlled just one part of Saxony. How can you control one third of Europe with that asset without being supported by someone else, right? And that's how this system works. So when you get those questions like, you know, why didn't this guy centralize? Well, because it wasn't needed. You could have an empire without making an enormous effort that uh, ultimately would also backfire because everybody would try to, 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 you know, think that you're really preparing to, to knock them out. I said this was much better because it's as if you floated on a system that obviously is unstable but still you it can allow you to make an imperial continental policy like the Etonians could do at this point. So I thought that this was particularly particularly interesting. And so if you consider that um, um, you know, who, who is that really had to provide this troop? I mean, how, on which base a, let's say, a single knight was raised? Well, we can make a reasoning by analogy in here because uh, by the times of Charles the, uh, the Bald, that was from late 9th century, so not excessively far away from, from, from the tent, um, every, uh, you know, the equipment of a heavy knight was required as the Capitular of Thionville says, to who owned at least 12 mansi, that is um, something like 120, uh, 160 um, hectares, mm -hmm. according at least to, to the generic uh, estimate that is um, usually um, 
fact taken it and it's it's however impossible to really translate this data into a precise uh, figure because uh, this changed really uh, you know and depended a lot on on many um, uh, on many factors because the the Mansi were not homogeneous right and and in fact uh, there was an attempt to to do in in the to the in some works uh, the, the, the there there have been many like Delbruck and Lot also studied these things but Wagner uh, tried to to write something more um, you know to to observe it, at least probably the these months was uh, were a bit larger than what was previously thought because naturally it, it especially as we were saying before these lands in Germany were on average less productive say in France so that also changes what these measures were and we don't really know about the estimates it's very complicated um, and uh, but uh, however here the important datum is that the uh, the base uh, and this is homogeneous for any kind of feudal society in order to have a heavy cavalry you need to have land and people will train on it with the resources that they draw from from there so um from the indicolus however it 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 turns out that probably at least among the uh, loricati there had to be several ministeriales right um so making the general estimate of all these lands it's possible it's definitely evident that there were even these elements that maybe weren't uh, that definitely needed that uh land to to um to be equipped but maybe they they didn't own it proper so um that is also particularly important and, and as we were saying before it, it's extremely advantageous for for whoever owns this serf because these knights as serfs were properly owned that is to say you could buy them sell them you could do whatever you liked um, and, and there was also kind of a market at one point of this uh, nights and there is all a literature about this maybe one day we'll take a look at it so this could be maybe on the origins of the ministerialis as a video but it's maybe too s generalistic uh, however in conclusion it's important to observe that um, in Ottonian Germany we can spot uh, the uh, elaboration at least of, of what will be uh, will remain typical for most of the Middle Ages in, into into this country that is from one side the persistence of a an infantry of of, of uh, free allodiers of free landowners right that especially in areas like Saxony will be maintained for a for a very long time from the other side the growth of a of a cavalry of servile condition the ministeriales that in the 12th century also will have given life to uh, the great german courtly culture you know the minnesanga the 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 ideal that probably in many ways we we together with the uh french tradition we we think to have been like the, 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 we see courtly uh culture like it think about the, even in art this portrayals the statues of Naumburg the Bamberg Ritter or all, all, all these great symbols of of chivalry of knighthood proper but also this human model actually that this new uh, anthropic vision of the world that is that is from ho on horseback and it nat naturally it, it starts uh, as a as an, an obvious aristocratic culture right but that has in itself still uh, this more in the case of Germany at least this more mitigated nature that has never quite forgotten the past the world of the forests the the darkness, if you want, the the inverted vision of 
of um, light and darkness that exists in Ger the Germanic world compared, let's say, to the Latin one, for example. And, and therefore, this character of deep, uh, even a, a, of deep commitment of, of, of these warriors, of these knights, into a system that was way less secular and secularized, in fact, than 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 in other countries like um in france this um you know you see that the modern mindset for example ar arrives earlier right um Germany has this long middle ages if you want you can interpret it a bit like this that lived of its own particularism of its own customs right and that starts exactly from paradoxically the same lack of feudalism because it was paradoxically through feudalism that you could create i mean not a complete lack of feudalism but let's say this progressive this greater presence of the original um um tr uh, of a uh, custom of war that that albeit more restricted if you want in terms of s of sheer um civilization a ability to centralize to build something greater more stratified or centralized like a monarchy would that in, in germany failed still maintains this maybe this truer even poetic form this this truer and more genuine and more um even more pragmatic sometimes because it's more poetic more romantic even if you want but it's still also very rooted in this world right even think about the, the demic um uh, con uh, you know uh, the, the spaces in which people lived um this world of that was not urbanized it will take centuries before it expands it's really it really finds its way and, and will always maintain this very localistic mindset this the local autonomy this idea that yes that can be a greater um institution that is deeply failed in many ways but at the same time that this institution lays its basis on the individual community on the individual uh, 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 what uh, this echo of the freeman if you want in a society that however is always very important to to stress is is absolutely not um egalitarian way we conceive it still based on its its own very sense of itself of its own differences as something defi in you know defining in a kind of a sometimes inflexible fashion because moder modernity eventually will pass through the breaking of this particularism i mean the modern state basically starts from there but these are further considerations that maybe you're not interested in <laughs> and so i'm sorry for all those who thought that now i'll probably try to make a um uh <laughs> let's say uh, a fitting title not to make you fall into the trap of listening to all this with thinking that I'm talking strictly about war because definitely we will make other videos about the Ottonian knight as the fighter, right, and how it was equipped, trained and all, but this was perhaps very good to give that kind of background you need to understand that world and uh, and we'll, we'll definitely go in depth also as we were saying at the beginning of the video, we will make videos about Eastern Frankish, uh, excuse me, Western Frankish, Italic um, knights, knighthood. Uh, we will see how, obviously how this evolves over time. So we will take everything step by step into consideration. And for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now. I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.